Hi, everybody. It's so exciting to see you here. Thank you so much for making along to this session, even with its somewhat gloomy title. Um, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the organizers of South By for inviting me to be here. And as you might have noticed, there's a brand new automated system in town. Uh, they have a system called Slido. So as I'm talking, you can submit questions and they'll be silently stack ranking them in the background so at the end we can have a discussion. And interestingly, that system is a really nice scene setter for what I want to talk with you about today. Because we are at a critical juncture. Automated systems and AI are moving ever further into so many systems of everyday life at the exact same moment as our political road is taking a sharp turn to the authoritarian side. So, my name's Kate Crawford. I'm a researcher and a professor, and I study the social impacts of machine learning and large-scale data systems. And one of the cool things about my job is that I get to visit AI labs around the world. So last year, I was invited to the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And you can see it here. It's absolutely beautiful. This is one of the fastest supercomputers in Europe, and it's currently working away on things like human genome research, astrophysical simulations, and protein modeling. And as you can probably tell, it's built inside a Catholic church. It's sort of nestled inside this far more ancient architecture about the divine reaching for deeper understanding and faith. And I have to say, it, it felt weirdly sacrilegious, sort of being in this space with a bunch of GPUs just grinding away in a house of worship. But at another level, it was actually completely appropriate because this incredible space is now connected to another form of power, another type of divination about the world that we live in, right down to the smallest cells in our bodies. This supercomputer is called Mare Nostrum, which means our sea. And you can kind of see why they called it that, right? It's working on huge amounts of data, this sea of data, the ocean that we swim in every day. That name also means something else, which I only came to realize a little bit later. It's a coincidental thing that actually this particular name invokes a relationship between advanced computation and that F word that is now returned into public discourse again, fascism. Because Mare Nostrum was the name of a key strategy of the fascist leader Benito Mussolini, who was obsessed with Italy owning the Mediterranean Sea. He built up one of the most powerful navies in the world so that he could basically return the Mediterranean to its glory days under the Romans when it was called a Roman lake. So he started using his strategy as a way to go, and eventually his plan was, to occupy the countries around the Mediterranean, from Egypt to Kenya. And this image is a fantastic still from one of his uh, television broadcasts, where he's saying, and I kid you not, we have to capture the ocean to make Italy great again. <laughs> seriously, seriously. I, I found it amazing. But as he found, controlling the ocean is a lot harder than you might think. So today, I was finding, I'm, I'm sort of reflecting on what it was like to be standing in this chapel with a stunning supercomputer with a name that was unintentionally evoking all of these issues of data, AI, and fascism. But the Mare Nostrum supercomputer for us will be like a little visual meme of what we're going to be thinking about today. Because right now, these issues are more closely intertwined than ever before. Just two days from now, we're going to see a huge walkout from tech workers around the US who are protesting the policies of the current administration. So I want to tell you a story, a story about what might be at stake, why I think it's urgent, and what we might be able to do about it. So it's no secret to anybody in this room that artificial intelligence and machine learning is rapidly advancing. We've seen some extraordinary things just in the last year in terms of leukemia detection, in terms of energy saving in data centers, in terms of things like facial recognition and audio processing. 
And of course, AI and decision support systems are rapidly being rolled into our social institutions as well. Everything from criminal justice to health to education. So right now, AI is influencing a lot of things from who is released from jail to shaping the news that you see. And it's interesting because, of course, there's this hyped techno-futurism about AI, but actually the systems are already here. And they're quite banal and in many ways probably touching your life already in a whole lot of ways that you just don't see. So just as we are seeing this step function increase in the spread of AI into our lives, something else extraordinary is happening. Another type of critical juncture. The rise of ultranationalism, of right-wing authoritarianism, and fascism. It's happening here in the US, but it's also happening in Spain, in Germany, in France, uh, and in the country where I grew up. The country that apparently the US has now declared war on, I think, Australia. Yeah, it's sad, we used to be great friends. It's a, it's a terrible thing. Now, the turn to authoritarianism is very different in every one of these countries. But as political scientists have pointed out, they have some shared characteristics. And I'm gonna just talk about three today. The desire to centralize power, to track populations and demonize outsiders, and to claim authority and neutrality without being held accountable. So these are the three things that I wanna think about today. Centralizing power, cataloging populations, and never being held to account. It's part of the power playbook, if you will. So AI systems could be an extraordinary check on the power of these types of regimes, but it's also really good at helping them along. What we've learned over the last 40 years since AI became a field, but particularly in the last five, is that it's really, really good at centralizing power, at claiming a type of scientific neutrality without being transparent or accountable. And this matters because we are witnessing the historic rise of what I think is a profoundly anti-democratic political logic. I want to give you an example of something that's been concerning me in the space of AI research. Uh, this image comes from a machine learning paper that came out in December that claimed that it could, simply from looking at a headshot, predict whether somebody was a criminal or not. Now, they did this by training a system on around 1,850 faces that came from Chinese government IDs, of which around 700 were convicted criminals. And they used a supervised learning system to basically start to look at the resemblances between the criminal group and the non-criminal group. And what they discovered is that the criminal group had this thing in common. Their faces were more dissimilar to the faces of the control group. So what they said is that once you start to feed it new images, it could predict with 90% accuracy whether somebody was the sort of person who would become a convicted criminal. Now that's an extraordinary number, that's huge. So they then finished the paper by saying, we have developed the first ever automated system for criminality detection and it's free from bias and free from human subjectivity. Fantastic. So I thought to myself, huh, all right, what if I could find a picture of the algorithm that they used? So this is what I found. Yep. Take some untrustworthy data, shift it around in the deep neural net, and out it spits infallible results. So okay, this isn't what they actually used, but it's not too far from the argument they're making. We should always be really suspicious when a machine learning system is saying that it's free from bias if it's been trained on human-generated data. Because our training data are the accounts of the human past with all of our own biases and stereotypes built into them. And clearly, there's another possibility here that this paper didn't consider, which is that the people who had dissimilar faces, they might look a bit strange, they might look a bit weird, were more likely to be seen as untrustworthy by the police and by judges. That's not a system that's free of bias. That's just encoding bias. So this would be, if you think about it, a terrifying system for an autocrat to get their hands on. 
Imagine if right now I could just have photos of all of your faces. We could do it, I'm sure we can. South by, let's get on it. Everyone on this side, oh, you're kind of the shifty criminal ones. You guys are fine. But don't worry, it's a completely scientific system. It's free from bias. And I would never be held to account. I could be completely beyond due process. And this has all happened before, of course. Some of you have probably heard about phrenology and physiognomy that debunked so-called sciences of detecting your character and your future from your face and your head shape. Now, these have a particularly nasty history of being used to justify the unjustifiable. Of course, here in the US, physiognomy was part of the justification of slavery in the 19th century, where it was claimed that African Americans just had less intelligent faces and therefore couldn't be trusted to control their own lives. The same thing happened with Nazi race scientists to claim that all Jews had no shapes that proved their untrustworthiness and criminality. And if this all sounds like the distant past, we've all moved on, we're so much better now, know that there are startups right now that are making money using exactly these type of phrenology principles. This graphic is part of the marketing material of a company called Faceception that claims that it has facial profiling, just looks at a picture of your face, and it can tell whether you are a potential terrorist. It's kind of interesting, because if you have a look at sort of the white girl with a cool haircut, she's a brand manager, but the guy who's slightly Arabic looking with facial hair, probably a terrorist. Yeah, I'm as concerned as you are about this one. So I personally think it's really worrying that we're seeing the tricks of fascist regimes of the past get a rerun in AI studies. Essentially, AI phrenology is on the rise at the same time as the re-rise of authoritarianism. Because even great tools can be misapplied and can be used to produce the wrong conclusions. And that can be disastrous if it's being deployed by regimes who just want to centralize their power and erase their accountability. Now, a lot of the high priests of data, the people for whom data is the new religion, are starting to ask what happens when there's a breakdown in the traditional separation of powers, when the church of data is being weaponized totally by the state, and all of those compute cycles, all of that ferocious power to classify and predict is not just in the high chapels of the technology sector, but it's in the hands of powerful state actors with long lists of enemies. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. And I worry that we could be seeing some dark days ahead. But we didn't just get here overnight. It's a good moment, I think, to think about what the past can teach us here. The historian Tony Judd, who is remarkable, and I strongly recommend you read his books, once said that if you ignore history, you're like a person stumbling around an old house in the dark. The house isn't empty, but you'll just keep bumping into the furniture. So I want to take you on a tour of some of these rooms. I want to think about the history of registries and the way that unaccountable power has been mobilized. And just to cheer you up at the end, <laughs> I'm going to think a little bit about what resistance might look like, about how we might work together to ensure that intelligence is working for us and not against us. All right, so let's talk about registries. What's a registry? Well, Basically, we've had registries for as long as we've had written records. You can go all the way back to the Babylonians in 3800 BC to find early records of these sort of registries, but it really wasn't until the ancient Greeks that it got to a high point. Basically, they believed that we had to keep a record of populations at the same time as we would keep a record of public morality. Cicero described it this way. Let a census review the ages, children, families, and properties of the people. Let them divide the groups of people into tribes and distribute them according to property, age, and rank. So this dividing of the tribes intensifies in the 17th and 18th century with the emergence of things like statistics and probability. And we start to see ever more abstract representations of human populations. They also had a brand new technology that was very exciting for catching criminals. For them, it was the fingerprint. But of course, the fingerprint is a physical property of our bodies. And these categories of race and religion and gender we know are far more fluid. 
So registries nonetheless reify these categories, by which I mean they are very good at putting people into pre-shaped boxes, even when it doesn't fit them very well. And as we'll see, it's often very difficult to sustain those categories, even as they're causing people harm. So things really start to accelerate in 1880, where a guy, young worker at the US Census Bureau, is sitting on a train. And he's watching the train conductor punch holes in a train ticket. And he's like, hey, this would be a really efficient system for tracking human characteristics. And that was the beginning of the Hollerinth machine. And here, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to break Godwin's law and talk about the Nazis, because of course the Nazis were the ones who bought Hollerinth machines en masse, and they used them from the 1930s onwards to create the largest racial registry to track Jews, Roma, and other ethnic groups. And this is the incredibly chilling promotional poster that they used for the Hollerinth machine. Have you guys seen this one before? It's I mean, for me, this is almost like the perfect representation of what James C. Scott calls seeing like a state. You've got the giant eye beaming light down into the holes of the catalog cards, just there classifying the population underneath. It's a truly horrifying image. Of course, IBM, who created the Hollerinth machine through their German subsidiary, offered the same database support to become the information subcontractor to the Japanese internment camps in America. And this didn't just happen during World War II. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of the Book of Life. Have you guys, have, put up your hand if you've heard of the Book of Life, anyone? Yes, fantastic, a couple of you. So the Book of Life uh, was basically created during the height of apartheid in South Africa. And it was used to create this enormous registry of the whole population, where you were divided into one of four categories. You were either white, black, colored, or Indian. But these categories were monitored in really unusual ways. Like, basically depended on like, who were you hanging out with? Who did you get married to? Um, who did you live with? And so some people changed category like three or four times over the course of their lives. And each time it changed, it would change how the police related to them. It would change what job they could get. It would change what restaurants they could eat in. So ultimately these registries started to reinforce a way of thinking that was itself autocratic. So we've had several centuries to get really good at creating registries, but over the last decade, something dramatic has happened. The processing of human characteristics doesn't just happen once every 10 years, like the US Census. It happens thousands of times per hour. It's happening on your cell phones, in your browsing history, in your Amazon shopping list. Essentially, the official state collections of census data are pretty quaint compared to how little data they really collect on you. And they also have really important functions like thinking about voter redistricting. Also, census data has far more legal protections, so that information can't just go to any government department. But the same cannot be said for privately collected data. So now we have these massive data dossiers driven by cheap storage, very powerful computing infrastructures and machine learning systems. And they're constantly analyzing your political, religious, and cultural preferences. And that has become what I tend to think of these days as an autonomous registry. It's modulating all the time with everything that you do, and it can be connected to other systems. Say, for example, like the car insurer who wanted to look at people's Facebook posts because if they were using exclamation marks, they might charge them more for their car insurance because apparently exclamation marks mean you're a little bit rash. I'm like, okay. At a far more extreme end, we can think about what's happening with China's social credit score, where everything that you write online, particularly if it's about the government, can have an impact on whether you can get a loan for your car or for a house. And now in the US, we have a president who has said that it would be good management to have a database of all of the Muslims in this country. And to some degree, we already have that. Facebook has become the default Muslim registry of the world. But we can remember that it's only when these registries are combined with authoritarian regimes that they become the roadmap of who to demonize, who gets tracked down, who gets deported. And so even though I think it's admirable that people are saying that they're not Muslim but they're happy to sign up to the registry as an act of solidarity, 
it's probably not going to work very well. Because frankly, these machine, machine learning systems are extremely good at looking at whether your past behavior indicates your religious preferences. A lot of you probably saw that study in 20, uh, 2013 that Cambridge University published. Incredibly important study that showed that it could predict so many of our characteristics just from our Facebook likes. And they can predict whether or not you're Muslim with around 83% accuracy. And that was a few years ago. So essentially, we have created new and incredibly powerful systems that mark out human difference. So let's talk about how power can move to obscure its own traces. Some of the earliest pioneers in AI had real concerns about how their systems could be used in dark political times. This is a picture of Joseph Weizenbaum. He's the guy who created Eliza, one of the earliest chatbots, uh, which was a huge success. And he was doing incredibly well. But he was starting to get these very serious concerns about how this could be used and how people just took it at face value. So he talked about this thing called the powerful delusional thinking about AI systems, that we assume they're far more intelligent than they really are. And he also was concerned that it puts distance between us and our decisions, so that if you're a war planner and you're looking at stats about the potential deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, that can just be thought of as a series of probabilities. And for him, he grew up uh, in Germany in World War II, so this connection to fascism was very, real, very sort of real and present for Weizenbaum. And he wanted to make sure that people understood that AI systems are not very transparent, and they give people this false sense of accuracy and neutrality. That is still true today. Um, I just published a paper with Mike Anony of USC where we look at the limitations of transparency. And what's interesting is that in the end, even if you're an engineer building, say, a deep neural net, and I'm sure some people in the room know this intimately, sometimes we don't even know why they work so well or why they're failing. This image comes from a paper in 2015 which shows how easy it is to fool a deep neural net. They're being sent squiggles, if you can see those, and it's saying, oh, that's a strawberry, or that's a donut. Or in my absolute favorite one, if you feed it a picture of the queen, <laughs> it says with 99% certainty that she's a shower cap. Yeah. <laughs> I feel sorry for the queen. That's, you know, that's, and as a colonial, that's a hard thing to say. Um, but yes, one of my other favorites that I really want to share with you today is this one. Uh, this is a very famous painting in art history. This is Manet's Olympia. And, you know, I mean, there's probably hundreds of art history PhDs that have been written about this. It's, you know, all of these connections to slavery and race and sexuality. But what happens if you feed it to a bunch of vision algorithms? Well, it looks a bit like this. This is something that the artists Trevor Paglin and Mike Krieger did, along with the co-founder of Instagram, sorry, Instagram's Mike Krieger, but also Trevor Paglin and Adam Harvey. And some of these really interesting vision algorithms are coming up with unusual responses. This one, for example, is trying to predict what Olympia is. Is she a pajamas? Is she a gown? My favorite, is she a burrito? Oh, and, and burrito is such a tell, because if you think about the people who are training these systems, we're talking about that percentage of the US population, the software engineer who's absolutely wedded to their favorite burrito place. They can probably tell you exactly where it is. And this gives us an insight into how our cultural preferences are being used to encode the world. So if it's a burrito, it's kind of funny. But these kinds of errors get much more serious when they're being built into the justice system. Now, as you know, predictive policing is through most major cities of the US right now. It's becoming very normalized. It is certainly not an AI system yet, but we'd call it a precursor in that a lot of the data that they're using is the kind of data that you'd use to train an AI system. So these systems ingest huge amounts of historical crime data as a way of predicting where future crime might happen, where the hotspots will be. But they have this unfortunate side effect, which is that the poorer, more, more, basically the neighborhoods that have had the worst policing in the past, so often poor black neighborhoods, are the ones that are coming out as the hotspots for future crime. So you end up in this vicious circle where the most policed areas become the most policed areas in future. And what is interesting is that there's very little accountability 
about how these things work. We just had a study come out by RAND that did the first sort of very in-depth, very, I think, quite impressive study of Chicago's predictive policing efforts. And what did they find? It was completely ineffective at predicting future crime. But it was really good at one thing. It was fantastic at increasing the level of harassment of people who were in the hotspot areas. So, so far, I've been telling you just about the systems that are unintentionally biased or unintentionally producing discriminatory results. But what if you intended it? What if you actually wanted to build a system that could, in one way or another, manipulate people's biases or their political beliefs? Or you wanted to deceive government officials? Well, here, we could also think about AI systems that could help you. Who has heard about Cambridge Analytica? Yeah, okay, that's basically most of you. Um, they've become very well known just in the last few months. They've been given a lot of credit for everything from making Brexit happen to getting Donald Trump into the White House. Now, I have some skepticism about just how good they are and whether they're actually doing what they say they do, but according to their marketing, they have 5,000 data points on 220 individual, 220 million individual Americans. That means they're creating highly tailored individual profiles based on a whole lot of data sources. Some of them are weird, like journal subscriptions and uh, land registries, and some of it is just huge amounts of Facebook likes. Again, springboarding off that Cambridge University study. And also, have you, anybody here filled in those personality quizzes, like which Disney character are you? Yeah, those things. That's what they're using. It's an incredibly useful way of understanding a lot more about how somebody thinks. So what they claim is that by using this, they are creating very detailed psychographic profiles where you can manipulate what somebody will do and think and of course, vote. And you change very specific targeted messages according to that person's profile. Now, I'm pretty skeptical about how good they are at this, but it does tell us one thing really important. This is the fantasy that they are selling. And we are getting really good at making technology that will be excellent at doing this just in a few years. So we've just got a bit of a view on the horizon of what's coming. This is, of course, a fascist dream. It's power without accountability. But we don't even have to buy into the theory that Cambridge Analytica are the big bad boys of data. You can actually just look at Facebook's own ads. This is an ad that Facebook used to say that they had shifted voters to support Toomey for Senate. Now, basically, this leads us to a key point. Whether or not the technologies that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook are selling actually work, they could be doing something almost as bad. They could be feeding a sense of hopelessness about our democracy. That if people start thinking that, well, there are no checks on power, that essentially there are these shadow actors that are manipulating our elections, then why bother voting? Why bother protesting? This is something that I'm seriously worried about. And where do we draw the line here? Well, I think we got a really good example last week. You might have seen the expose in the New York Times on Uber's Grayball system. So Grayball is a fake version of Uber's app. It's populated with ghost cars, and they were using it to evade oversight from government officials in terrains where they'd been banned. And this image is actually from one of Uber's own campaigns, which unfortunately is coming back to haunt them, if you don't mind me saying that. I just couldn't help it. Um, but it's, for me, this has obviously got huge ethical and legal problems. But most importantly, I think it's a reminder to us that these systems can be working invisibly in ways that we'll never see. I mean, a lot of people in this room probably have the Uber app on your phones, but you had no idea that Grayball was a part of that system and that it was actually making decisions about who to pick up and when. So now, these type of black box systems are moving right into the business of government itself and are now going to be used as part of the system to run mass deportations. Because we now know, thanks to a leak to The Intercept, that Palantir is building the intelligence system for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE. They've been doing this for a few years, but this is a huge new version that will be drawing on a vast ecosystem of data from people's biometrics 
to where they work, to where they live, to all of this personal information that they can draw on. And essentially, they've designed this system so that no less than 10,000 users can access it at any time to search tens of millions of subject records. This could be the most powerful engine of mass deportation that the country has ever seen. And what kind of accountability would you have here? If you were a worker and you were being picked up and deported, what sort of due process would you have? How would you say, no, this system actually got it wrong? You've actually got the wrong data about me. So we're living in a really volatile moment right now. We have these incredibly intimate, vast systems of data being connected to really powerful AI systems that are often oblique and unaccountable. I think the fascists of the 20th century would have done a lot to get this kind of power. Now, one of the great philosophers of fascism, Hannah Arendt, once said that the thing that really kept the totalitarians back in the 20th century is that their technology sucked. They really had some appalling tools. They had the lie detector, which just wasn't that good. It was very time consuming. It didn't work half the time. It had to be in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Then she eerily predicts in 1968, basically that Palantir system that I just showed you. This is what she wrote. Now the police dream that we could look at a gigantic map in the office and it would suffice at any moment to establish who is related to whom and in what degree of intimacy. This dream is not unrealizable, although the technical execution is quite difficult, she says in 1968. If this map really did exist, not even memory would stand in the way of the totalitarian dream to domination. Such a map might make it possible to obliterate people without any trace, as if they had never existed at all. I can't think of a more evocative statement of a technology-driven deportation and disappearance system. So, what are we gonna do about it? What is the new resistance going to look like? And how are we gonna know authoritarianism when it comes? Because to be clear, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> I also know that history teaches us that it can arrive in subtle and often unpredictable ways. We just don't know how close we are to any individual tipping point. So the philosopher Umberto Eco, who grew up in fascist Italy, wrote this fantastic essay that I strongly recommend everyone check out. It's called Ur Fascism. And he writes about what he calls the eternal nature of fascism, the way it always keeps coming back. He wrote it this way. Fascism is still around us, sometimes in plain clothes. It would be much easier for us if someone appeared on the world scene saying, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to parade again in the Italian squares. But life is not that simple. Earth fascism can come back in the most innocent of disguises. So this is something that I think about in terms of how we understand authoritarian tendencies. They're all around us all the time. They're traveling with us like germs on the subway. And they can invade and infect us if we're not equipped with a really strong immune system. Like any living, evolving, complex system, our democracies are frequently fighting off ailments and disorders. So when we think of resistance then, perhaps we need to think of something like this, like an immunoresistance system, where we're working together to be strong enough to fight off attacks on a healthy body politic. But how do we build systemic resistance? I don't know about you, but I think we've had some really good signs in the last few months. I mean, we've seen millions of people do lots of things, from writing letters to even going to airports that they didn't have to go to, which frankly is an extraordinary thing for many of us. I mean, if that's not a sign, I don't know what is. So in the end, I think this is the positive thing that I want you to take away today, is that dark days can also be immunostimulants. They can challenge us to be prepared. And I think we've seen in history that resistance can be incredibly effective. I don't know how many of you recognize this guy, but back in the 1940s during World War II where everything looked hopeless, this guy, René Camille, worked to sabotage the Hollerent system in occupied France. What he did is he damaged the 11th column that marked out Jewish identity. And by doing this one thing, he saved thousands of lives. But of course, we can't remove the 11th column if we don't know it's there. 
So this is part of the reason that I think it's so important that we have a much deeper understanding of how our AI systems are working. So essentially, the ocean of our data systems is completely vast at the moment. It's just enormous. And as we in the technology industry are continuing to build our mare nostrums, our chapels of machine learning and artificial intelligence, we also have to map their complex subterranean and often unintended effects. All of the examples that I've given you today came from journalists, researchers, lawyers, and engineers who did an enormous amount of work to show us what lay underneath. And I really want to thank them today. I want to thank Julia Angwin at ProPublica for her incredible work on machine bias. I want to thank uh, Mike Isaac, who did that amazing Uber story in the New York Times. I also want to thank all of the scientists and researchers who test these systems and take risks to publish that information. Because you guys are making our immune system stronger. You're making us better at understanding how these systems work. So what am I going to do? Because frankly, I really want to contribute to this effort as well. So along with several of my colleagues, we're going to build a research community just focusing on the social impacts of artificial intelligence. And it's called AI Now. This is going to be an independent research community that will be tracking how AI is deployed in all of our core social institutions and how we might be able to do that better. So along with my co-founder, Meredith Whitaker, we are going to be researching areas like bias and machine learning, the effect of automation on labor, and how AI is affecting everything from our critical infrastructure through to our basic rights and liberties. The reason it's called AI Now is because we're really interested in the effects in the near term, the next 10 to 15 years. We're not really focusing on the superintelligence or the singularity, but basically how people are being affected today. And realistically, if this is something that you want to be interested in working on too, please come and see us at the end of the talk today, because we want to do this collectively to build a forensics of AI. Because only when we know how things are working, and I think even more importantly, how they're failing, can we actually start to have due process and accountability. And I don't just mean legal accountability here. I mean a type of public accountability, that we understand that these systems are being used to make decisions like whether we get housing, whether we get into university, when you get released from jail, or whether you get deported. We want to make sure that these systems are as fair and as ethical as possible and free from unseen biases, or at least as good as we can get. And I'm delighted to say that the ACLU has decided to come on board with us to be a founding partner of AI Now. And they're going to be basically providing the insight about how we connect these technical systems to the impact on civil liberties. Because done right, AI is going to be an extraordinarily powerful tool for keeping particular types of power structures in check. But in the wrong hands, I think it could be also really concerning. So that's what we're going to be working on. And if you're interested in getting in touch, or if you are too also working on fairness issues, transparency and accountability, come up to the mic and tell me a little bit about what you're doing as well, because it would be great to get more of a community here at South by talking about these things. So ultimately, dark days can push us to be stronger together. But it's not going to happen if we sit back passively and just assume that everything's going to work out OK. Because right now, I think the response to the rise of authoritarianism is to build our immune resistance and to keep each other strong. Because AI is going to be a core part of what the future is going to look like, and we want to make sure that that is a place that we want to live. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So feel free to come up to the mic if you don't like dealing with an automated system for questions after all of that. Um, I've already got some good ones coming up here. So I'm going to take one from Slido, and then hopefully I can talk to some real humans. So feel free to come up and make that easier on me. Um, the first question I have here is, what about bias when we are creating AI? And this is a really good question. Um, 
Everybody here is probably very familiar with Google Gorilla. We had a whole panel on it here at South by last year. Um, one of the things that's interesting about a system like that is that we often assume that it's bias in the training data. That essentially what happened is that they just didn't have enough white faces to train their image recognition system on. But actually what happened in the case of Google Gorilla is, is even more interesting. Because what they decided, and this was a predominantly white team of engineers, that words like pig and cow were probably offensive and you probably want to take them out. But there, was, there wasn't anybody in the room who said, well, gorilla has, really has this horrible history as a racist epithet. Maybe we want to take that one out too. So that could be a really good example of the bias in the room, of trying to think about who's there and how you build really diverse teams. I think it's an important part. It's not a whole answer, but I think it's a really important part of some of these problems and how we might want to address them. But now we have a real person. Hi. Hi. Uh, fantastic talk. Thanks. Uh, but would actually doing forensics, checking for bias, all that stuff, wouldn't that just make a perfect AI system? And would that actually be better? Oh, I love that question. Do we really want perfect AI? That's a great point. Um, and actually, to be honest with you, I don't think we've had enough of a public debate about where we really want AI to be brought to bear. Are there places that we actually don't think AI is useful or we just don't want it involved? That's, that sort of nuance and that kind of subtlety, I'm really hoping we're gonna get there. But the only way we get there is by actually getting people to understand where AI is already working. So part of what we're doing with AI now is really just doing this process of being an early warning system and an empirical research initiative. So we can say, okay, here's where it's working. Let's go and see how it's working. And then let's go and talk to the people who are being affected. So if you're a patient in a hospital or if you're someone who's just been arrested by the police using a large scale predictive policing system, how did that affect you? What were the differences? I think that will tell us something really useful in making the decision you're talking about which is when do we not want to see AI actually affecting our lives? There's another question up here um, that I'll take from, from Slido. Um, okay, here we go. Um, aren't some biases good and beneficial? Isn't that what sets us apart from the machines, having an evolved sense that a snake is dangerous, for example, and how do we discern? And this is a really good question. Um, we do obviously have a lot of um, almost autonomic responses that are built in. Um, and some of those responses actually come from the culture around us. Some of them like jumping when we see a snake come from a, a very different system and a much longer history. Um, I think we're pretty good at having discussions about what biases are actually manifesting that come from structural inequity. They're the ones that I'm really worried about. I'm less worried about the snakes, um, but I'm really worried about histories of structural prejudice being encoded into our systems, basically ingrained to the point where they inform decisions and we don't even know it's there. That's the part that's most worrying to me, is that if you don't even know that, say, for example, in that great study about employment bias that um, was done by Anupam Dutta and his team that showed by using Google's job search system, that men were seeing far more of the jobs that were sort of 200K and over and the coaching services. Women weren't even seeing them. So that's like a system where, again, it's kind of like invisibly ingrained. You can't apply for a job if you don't know it's there. So those are the sorts of things that I'm, I'm much more concerned about. But it's a great question. Hi. Hi, uh, thank you so much, it's been really interesting. Uh, my name is Ellen, I work at the Open Data Institute and we've also been thinking a lot about how you introduce greater visibility, um, openness, transparency into AI, not like openly licensing, you know, um, openly licensing your IP, but how do you make it more visible? And we've discovered that there's quite a lot of subtle pushback on openness. I don't know if you've seen Nick Bostrom's paper um. with, that talks in very reasonable ways about that this would be very reckless, that it would be very bad to um, allow people to not see the inner workings, but even understand how these things work. So I'm wondering how pervasive that is, those kinds of pushback, mm -hmm. and what other kinds of arguments you've heard. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and it's kind of fascinating, right? Because we've got to this point where thinking about open data, which was so important, I think, in the early history of the internet and early data systems, has actually got to this point now where people are really concerned about it. And certainly, uh, Nick Bostrom aside, I think a lot of privacy researchers are saying, look, 
you know, we can't just make all of this data about individuals at that level of granularity open and public. That could actually be used for a lot of really worrying things. But neither do I think that we just want to say, hey, just, just, you know, let the people who have the data do what they want to do and keep it proprietary and no one gets to play with it, because that in itself produces a different kind of problem. So what do we do? So there are some really smart people thinking about this in relation to how do you create vetted data commons. It's really hard to do, um, but certainly if you bring the best tools we have to bear, things like differential privacy and others, we might be able to imagine how you create open data sets that don't also expose people to risks. But I'm going to be honest with you, I think that's one of the hardest problems. I think certainly just make it open is just not a response that's going to address the sort of issues that I was talking about today. We're going to have to get, um, and your group is clearly one, people who are sort of thinking about the complexity of this, when open data will help, and when it might harm. Hi, how are you Hi. doing? Fantastic talk. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hunter. Um, I do a lot of data visualization work. and. I think a lot of people don't make any uh, decisions or make any actions unless it's very in front of them. If it's mm -hmm. abstract, like data, yep. they have no idea. If it's sitting in a server, in a data broker server, they don't care. Mm -hmm. If they see themselves, like, like there was a famous example a few years ago of a German politician and where he wandered around and so forth. Yes. That really kind of brought home the idea that, wow, I, I, someone else can see everywhere I've went in the last week. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about the importance of visualization and tools that would help people who are not programmers, data scientists, recognize themselves and see how bad or whatever it is. Yeah, spot on, absolutely agree. Um, I think it's critical right now. I mean, the people in this room, you guys, we could do a lot more to explain these systems to people who are having to deal with them every day without even knowing it. How would you visualize it? How would you make it like palpable through a UX or through something else or through sort of public information. I think that's key. And I think some, there are some really smart data visualizers working on these sorts of things. I'm thinking here of Jeff Thorpe at the Office for Creative Research. There are lots of groups trying to do really smart visualizations of essentially complex problems. Because some of these things, I mean, honestly, the only way that we're gonna unpack this is by making it visual, making it clear. The other thing I would say, and um, I'm delighted to see a couple of fantastic artists in the room today, is that I have a lot of hope for the way that artists can make this work really palpable. Um, I mentioned a few in my talk, but also Heather Dewey Hagborg, who's here in the front row, is doing really important work in terms of how do we make the sort of data trails that we leave feel palpable? How do we sort of, as she does, you know, collect, uh, just swipe a subway and then use that to try and build a DNA profile just mm -hmm. from what somebody left behind? I mean, these are really interesting ways of thinking about complex systems. Um, but I'm with you, because that is the big challenge and we need to do it really soon. Of course, we'll pay for that too. <laughs> yeah, more of that, exactly. Thanks, Kate. Um, just wondered, it leads on a little bit from what was just discussed, but just wondered whether um, in your experience, um, whether you think data literacy in the population is a big issue around this. Um, we have a hypothesis um, uh, in the, I work for the South Australian government and we're sort of looking at digital ethics and um, a lot of these issues at the moment and one of our hypotheses is that um, people actually don't understand the data trails that they're leaving. How would they? <laughs> so, well, first of all, hello comrade, it's great to see you. Um, I know that the US is looking at you very closely right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was scared about getting yeah, in actually. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, the second thing I would say is that, oh, and this is really hard to say, and forgive me, and you're welcome to come and lecture me out of it later. I just don't know if data literacy is gonna get us out of this one. Because saying to people, oh, learn how to code, or go and build your own AI system, I mean, that's lovely for understanding the basics, but really, is that gonna help you understand how predictive policing is working? Is that gonna help you understand how Palantir's deportation system is working? It's really not. Um, it might help us if, we need to ask critical questions around data systems. And so I think these kinds of groups, the people in this room, the people who are already asking critical questions are amazing because you get to go and build systems and talk to the people building systems and say, hey, think about these questions. That means a lot to me. But I think trying to like get the entire population of the world up to some sort of AI literacy level, 
that's going to be really hard and we just don't have that long. I think, I think we have a, a bit of an urgency here that you know, isn't, isn't going to happen at that rate. Um, I just want to answer this one question from Slido because <laughs> it's a really good one. Um, what is your view on algorithms that are profiling international travelers including special screening at airports. <laughs> well, this is near and dear to my heart um, as somebody who gets profiled at airports. So you might have heard that a documentary maker here at South By just, just flew in two days ago, was stopped um, at the airport. Uh, he is an American citizen. He hadn't been to particularly any countries that would have set off a red flag um, and was taken to secondary and was asked a lot of really difficult questions. Um, and he wrote about this uh, just, you know, in Twitter saying, you know, this is, this is really changed for me. I've never had these sorts of problems before. And the officer at um, sort of Customs Border Patrol said to him, oh, look, mate, it's just the algorithms, mate. I don't know. Like, maybe you've just, you just look like one of those guys. <laughs> and, and I thought it was a really interesting response because at a certain point, they don't know why you've been flagged. It's just the algorithms, right? So trying again to think about when these systems distance us from difficult spaces of accountability, and let's be clear, the border is a difficult space, that's something that I think we have to track very closely. And certainly, borders and liminal areas are where you start to see power really exerting itself. So I would say keep a close eye on what's happening on the US border, because it will tell us a lot about what's coming down the pipeline. One more question, thanks. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, one area that I'm more interested in in the AI effects is AI in news and content creation. Mm -hmm. um, a tool like automate, Automated Insights where it generates you know, financial reports based off of the numbers, which yeah. is fine, but when it gets over the top with certain other content creation, that's one area that I'm concerned about the most. I'd like yep. to hear some thoughts of, about that. So what concerns you most about these systems? The fact that you can't see the data that's going in or you can't see the determination they're making from that data? Um, both, the inputs. In, so when, when a person writes an article, right, mm -hmm. as a reader, I know, you know what type of articles they write mm -hmm. or also the, their backstory of where they come from or, or maybe their biases. I, I can generate my own critical thinking when I read an article to see, okay, how much do I um, take it as a fact, yeah. or, right? And, and I do cross analysis in, on other websites. Yeah. But when it comes from a machine, it's a black box, right? Yeah. Content comes out of it. I don't know the input. I don't know how it came to that output, uh -huh. right? Um, yeah. I'm a skeptical person. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's good, you should hang on to that. Um, let me give you an answer about where I think this is going, because of course, in the, with the rise of fake news, uh, this is incredibly important right now. And what we're seeing is not just the fact that you know, there's a set of news sources that are sort of being fed into a range of systems, it's that they're being overlaid into other AI systems that aren't gonna tell you, oh, this comes from the New York Times or this comes from ByteBart. Um, you might have all seen that amazing thing that happened with Google last week, when if you did a search on is Obama planning a coup, it came up with a black box, like this is the correct answer, Definitely yes. By the end of the year, Obama is planning a communist takeover. I was like, what? How did this happen? Um, and of course, it's, it, you know, search is itself a very sophisticated AI system that's overlaid on a whole news ecology that we've all developed a type of literacy and we can kind of tell where news comes from very quickly. These AI systems are really just looking at where's the attention? What are people clicking on? That's a definitive answer. They're using different signals. Um, so I think the real challenge for engineers, uh, the challenge for designers, is thinking about how do you bring in those kind of heuristic knowledges, those ingrained literacies that we have. Um, because we've got some, you know, we've got some real problems emerging already. And fortunately, you know, in Google's case, they sorted that out very quickly. Um, big tech companies are pretty good at responding to, to those things pretty fast, but there are a lot of systems that are occurring that's in the back end. You won't even see it. If that's being applied in a health system or in the criminal justice system and you can't see it, that's when it really starts to worry me most. Um, I think that's it, guys. Can I just say thank you so much? It's wonderful to have you here.